Hello, welcome to the channel. I'm speaking with Professor Michael Woldemariam, who is an Associate Professor of International Relations at Boston University's Party School of Global Studies and the Director of the African Studies Center. Woldemariam's teachings and research interests include African security studies, with a particular focus on armed conflict in the Horn of Africa. And his publications include written works in, from journals such as Nationalism and Ethnic Politics, Terrorism and Political Violence, the Journal of Strategic Studies, and the Journal of Eastern African Studies. I'm pleased to have Dr. Woldemariam on the channel. Welcome. Good to be with you, George. So I want to begin with the recent developments of the military coup attempt in Sudan, which saw Abdel Fattah al-Burhan, the former chairman of the Transitional Military Council, assume control of the government and order the dissolution of the civilian-led transitional government led by Prime Minister Abdallah Hamdak. In response, the African Union has suspended Sudan from its continental activities. The international uh, community has called for a restoration of the former government and quite possibly the most immediate consequence is the funding from the World Bank and the United States has been withheld. This coup follows a recent failed attempt in September 2021 in which Prime Minister Hamda claimed that the perpetrators came from people inside and outside the military and were suspected of being loyalists to former President Omar al-Bashir, who was himself ousted in 2019 following months of protests concerning the rise of bread costs. What are some of the short and long-term consequences of the sudden political crisis in Sudan, and how will it affect the fragile democratization of the country? Yeah, uh, well, again, George, uh, good to be with you. Um, you know, I think there are a couple of different impacts, uh, short and long-term impacts of, of the, this, this military coup or coup attempt. I think the outcome is, is uh, to be determined uh, at this point, but obviously, um, if you're someone who sort of intrinsically cares about democracy, democratization, human rights, rule of law, um, those sorts of items, then then the coup is alarming, right? Because it 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 could uh, see uh, the military's you know more full reassertion of authority, political authority in Sudan over the Sudanese state, um, and that would obviously damage the long run prospects for democratization in that country, which of course of course, closely tied uh, to civilian rule, right? Popular civilian rule. So I think that's, that's I think, one concern. Um, and that's obviously connected to the broader region, right? If you've been following what's been happening uh, in the Horn of Africa over the last 24 months, um, you know, you, I think you would conclude uh, that democracy, democratization projects are really on the back foot. Um, we obviously have a situation in Ethiopia, um, sort of long running problems of authoritarianism in some other neighboring countries like Djibouti, Eritrea, of course, South Sudan. Um, and so, you know, Sudan was up until I think this moment oftentimes considered kind of the pace setter in, in the region in terms of democratization, given the way that the, the post-2019 transition period was playing out. There seemed to be some forward movement challenges, no doubt. But but one one does get concerned about the spillover of sort of uh, the failure of this demo democratic project in Sudan, and that the idea and potential of democracy regionally is undermined if it, if it fails in Sudan. Um, so that's one set of concerns. Uh, the, the other concern, of course, is just basic stability of, of the Sudan in the state and into a civil war. Um, technically, Sudan never actually really got out of civil war. Of course, there have been active conflicts in, in the Sudanese periphery that had been put on hold uh, when Bashir was ousted. Um, and so um, th there is some concern that if the, the military doesn't back down, um, if the protesters continue to mobilize as you're, they are doing and you would expect them to, if uh, there are clashes and the military mets out violence, that this could spiral in, in, in major urban centers into, into basically civil war armed conflicts, civilians uh, organizing themselves and trying to resist violence. Um, you also have the question of the Sudanese periphery uh, the two areas, Darfur, where there are armed groups that are, I think, quite uh, some armed groups, a couple that are obviously going to be quite nervous about uh, this military coup um, and may and may try and push back uh, at a certain point. And then on top of that, this entire uh, crisis puts a lot of pressure on the Sudanese security apparatus that, that is it's itself divided, right? Um, and so, you know, one 
you know, one strategy that Bashir used to coup proof his regime was to create all of these overlapping security networks that are that are still around. Um, and they are set up against one another. Uh, at times they they are in agreement and move as one. At other times they 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 may have differences. And so I could see I could see the, the sort of pressures of this crisis uh, creating more full ruptures between elements of the security apparatus. I'm thinking in particular about the, the, uh, the uniformed armed forces, the SAF, Sudanese armed forces, um, and, and the RSF, rapid support forces of, of Hameti. Well, how are other uh, African countries and the international community in general reacting to the news? Um, of course, the Arab League and the African Union have some leverage in Sudan. Are there any influences that they have in the military's decisions on the governing process of the country? Yeah, so you know, I think the the responses. Uh, I mean, there. I think across the board, there have been the the, the, the response is one of concern, uh, an alarm. But once you tr further unpack international responses, you're going to see some variation. Of course, uh, the AU has suspended uh, Sudan as it did. Um, in 2019, in the summer of 2019, when violence was used to, to break up uh, the, the sit-ins that ousted Bashir and were trying to pressure the, the tra military transitional government that had replaced him. Um, and, uh, you know, and the AU's posture on these, on these sorts of things is almost reflexively to oppose unconstitutional changes in government. I mean, this smacks of that because uh, Burhan and the military have violated the, the transitional constitutional charter, right? Um, so, so I think it's natural for the AU to take the posture that it has, that it has, uh, that it has taken. Um, whether uh, they are willing to apply further pressure, I think remains to be seen. I'm a bit skeptical on that front. Uh, the United States, the Europeans, uh, the, the quote unquote West, if, if you want to call them that, um, have obviously uh, taken a hard line as, re as well, um, uh, have expressed uh, and condemned uh, the military coup. Uh, and have, I think, as you noted, uh, pulled aid. And in the United States case, it's a significant amount of aid on the table, right? So as part of the normalization of US-Sudan relations that happened last year, uh, well, it was a long process. I think it ended earlier this year. Uh, you, uh, the United States, uh, well, Sudan uh, did a number of things, including signing on to the Abraham Accords or indicating that they would join the Abraham Accords. And the United States committed $700 million uh, in assistance. Uh, to Sudan uh, to support their democratization process uh, and their economic recovery. Um, and so that now that is in jeopardy. Uh, the United States obviously not, not going to follow through on that, that commitment given, uh, given the military coup. I think that's a reasonable and appropriate uh, response. You know, but the, on, the, on the other side of the ledger, uh, you have a number of countries that um, uh, I would anticipate will be, uh, well, either helped incite the coup uh, provided soft support for the idea of a coup, um, and in the subsequent days and weeks, may try to provide the Sudanese military some political cover. And so here I'm talking about countries like Egypt. Uh, I'm talking about the UAE potentially, uh, possibly Saudi Arabia. Uh, and you know, I think the United States, the Europeans, the AU, I mean, they're working hard to get these countries on side. Uh, so that everyone is communicating the same message to the parties and to the military in particular about how unwise this coup was. Um, but obviously those countries, that latter set of countries have different in interests um, and a different set of uh, different inclinations towards military rule and authoritarianism more generally in Sudan. How can we compare the history of coup attempts in Sudan to one another? For instance, in 1989, when Omar Bashir first came to power versus when he was ousted versus all the other attempts that are of significance. What is it uh, that the military does in order to establish itself in the government? Are there any differences in the way that they do so? Do they recognize the power of the population in order to promote its agenda? Gosh, that's a, um, you know, that is a good question, George. And I, I, I am, you know, not, uh, you know, I'd have to think back and reflect on and do a little bit more reading about the history of, of military coups in Sudan. And as you well know, there have been many, right? I mean, Sudan has historically been, along with Nigeria and a few other countries, one of the most coup prone, military coup prone countries uh, on the African continent, um, which is saying something. Um, you know, I think 
I, I, I'd maybe note one difference, and uh, maybe I'm on shaky ground here uh, because my recollection of the history isn't as good as it, as it should be. Uh, but some of the previous coup attempts in Sudan have had, they've oftentimes emerged in the context of political or economic crisis, and for that reason have attracted some dimension of popular support. Um, even the 89 coup to some degree, uh, which you know ousted a civilian government. And I need to tread carefully here because again, my, my history may be off. But that's quite different, I think, from what we're seeing in Sudan right now, where uh, the Sudanese street um, and most civilian actors, not all, but, but most, seem to be uh, uh, quite critical and quite opposed uh, to, uh, to the military coup. Um, so I think that's, that's probably one, uh, one notable difference. Of course, in 1989, that, that coup um, I mean, it was a it was really a, a coalition project uh, between the Sudanese military and uh, Islamist elements. You know, the NIF Hassan Al Turabi, um, uh, who died a couple of years back. So that's also maybe one difference here. Although there may be Islamist elements elements of of, of, um, of the old NCP that may be that may also be involved in in this coup attempt. It's hard to say at this point. Well, to wrap up the context of Sudan and their coup attempts, one of the normalization process steps that was taken between the US and Sudan was their removal from the state sponsor of terrorism list uh, in the previous year, as well as their recognition that the RSF uh, was essentially an armed group that was uh, ravaging the countryside of uh, Sudan. What significance does the instability have on those groups repopulating or strengthening? Yeah, I mean, that's uh, another good question, George. I think, you know, my reading of the sort of normalization, uh, well, the, the Sudanese transition since 2019 um, and uh, related to that, the normalization of, of U.S.-Sudan ties, I mean, my read is a bit different in, insofar as I think what those dynamics did was actually to legitimate or legitimize the RSF, right? Because of course, Hamedti himself is a vice president of the Sovereign Council, right? That was, I mean, he is a, he was, he has become a critical pillar of, of the entire transition. And so uh, in some ways might, some might say that that itself was a weakness of the transition process overall, that it was a very unstable and difficult bargain, a coalition between different elements of the security apparatus and the civilian forces, which are themselves a diverse amalgam amalgamation of different interests. Um, and so some would say this whole exercise legitimated what, what were actors that should have never really been involved in politics, which is the security sector, right? Um, and so, uh, you know, and so, so in some ways, what we're seeing right now is itself a, a byproduct of the weaknesses of, of the transitional framework and agreement as it emerged in 2019. Now, to be charitable, someone you could just respond and say there was no other choice, right? The military had the monopoly on coercive power, um, and if we were going to get to democratization, it required their buy-in, and that's that's probably true uh, to a certain extent. Well, now taking the context of Sudan into the Horn of Africa more generally, how do you uh, predict or? if you can speculate on this issue, maybe uh, it's too early to tell. How do you think that the coup in Sudan will affect the conflict that we're seeing in the Tigray region of Ethiopia? Uh, two examples that I want to cite uh, with respect to Sudan's proximate international issues are uh, the Al Fashaga border area, which is a fertile farming territory, which caused Amhara regional authorities to demand the federal government in Addis Ababa to place a military emphasis between the border of Sudan and Ethiopia. And the second is the Grand Ethiopian Renaissance Dam, where the site of the project is a mere 20 kilometers from the border between Sudan and the Benishangul Gumuz region, which has seen increased uh, rebel group activity. What do you think that the instability Sudan has uh, on the war in Tigray? Are there any uh, warning signs that we need to be aware of? Well, I mean, <laughs> You know, let me just start with with the most mundane point uh, that one can make on this, which is, you know, instability and conflict and crisis in one country is is um, in most instances not good for the neighborhood, right? Um, uh, 
again, that's a very basic point, but uh, you know, but if we're looking at the relationship between Sudan, Ethiopia, broader crisis dynamics in the Horn region, um, one should worry about what's happening in Sudan, right? And vice versa. Um, but to, maybe I'll make some more particular uh, observations. Um, you know, it's, it, it is really beyond what I just said, it is really difficult um, to map out the potential scenarios and how, you know, how the Sudanese crisis is going to affect, for instance, you know, a lot of observers. Um, you know, on the one hand, um, uh, the military's assertion of, more fulsome assertion of its authority in Khartoum uh, would raise some real concerns. Uh, so if you follow this discussion, I mean, Burhan himself uh, was considered a sort of hardliner on, on, the, on the border issue, the Al-Fashaga border dispute. Um, this is what you hear. Um, and so if, if that is the understanding, then, then his kind of sidelining of civilian forces, I think raises concerns about you know, what Sudan, you know, the tenor of Sudan-Ethiopia relations going forward. But at the same time, um, the, the military and civilian elements, at least as I understand, were for the most part aligned uh, on, on Ethiopia issues and uh, the Nile, the border dispute, the Tigray crisis. That was a place or that was a set of issues where they, they mostly agreed. Um, so, um, so in that sense, there might not be much change, right? Uh, so if the, if the transition sticks, uh, and the civilians are able to sort of come back uh, and, and lay claim to what is, I think, is the rightful authority, you know, Ethiopia-Sudan relations may still be quite difficult. Um, so, yeah, I mean, so that that is sort of um, how I would see it. I mean, the other thing I would say, though, is, look, I, I think some of the, the interstate conflicts and crises uh, that we've seen in this region, both at the present moment historically, um, are oftentimes symptoms of deeper domestic problems, right? And, and I tend to be of the view that without a sustained, a success of a sustained democratization project in many countries in the region, um, you name them, you know all the countries in the region, we really can't talk about sustainable peace and security between countries. Or we can't talk about regional peace and security in any fundamental way, it's going to require reforms of what have historically been deeply rooted and embedded authoritarian political systems. I tend to be of that view, I've always believed that. Well, turning into the conflict in Tigray, the region has seen a multitude of airstrikes on what the Ethiopian government calls military targets. Over the past week, attacks in Mekele have left civilian casualties and the infrastructure needed to facilitate emergency response has been diminished significantly. My question is, is there any proof that the targets the Ethiopian government is hitting are solely for military purposes of the Tigrayan uh, resistance? Is it too early to even make that assertion? Yeah, and again, I, ha I haven't been, you know, uh, paying close attention to, to some of the details and competing claims. And obviously, you know, you know, when you, you follow the, the crisis in Ethiopia, you know, you know, it is there's a military struggle and there's also a war of narratives. And it's very, very difficult uh, to parse those narratives. Um, you know, obviously the, the government's claims are that they struck military targets. Uh, Tigrayan authorities have said, um, you know, that that's untrue and that these are civilian targets. Um, it's very difficult uh, to make any sort of claim either way. I think what we can say with some confidence uh, is that civilians have, have been killed in the course of these airstrikes, right? Um, that does appear to be the case. Um, and, you know, I, I, I think most observers would be quite concerned about a sustained air campaign in Tigray uh, or in other parts uh, of Ethiopia, right? I mean, civilians are likely to be harmed uh, when that sort of air campaign is, is undertaken. Um, you know, but ground operations and ground offensives in different directions are also causing a lot of civilian harm um, in Tigray and outside of it. Um, so, so, yeah, the other thing I would say here is I think one challenge of part in part narratives um, in general, but on this issue specifically, is that the most of the UN system and then most of the, 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 um, the aid agencies have been forced to pack up their operations in Tigray and leave. Um, so it's very difficult to assess what the ground truth is on, on, a, on, on an issue like that. Of course, we know the basics of the crisis in Tigray in particular. We know about the food crisis. We know about um, uh, you know, some of the, 
other humanitarian issues, human rights violations that, that occurred in the context of, of, of the war, um, Tigray and other, other regions of Ethiopia as well. So we know that much, but, but it, it is difficult to kind of parse these debates about who's doing what to whom. Um, and that, that, that certainly applies to the airstrikes. Well, what is the reason for the unsuredness of the reality on the ground? Is it because of the communications blackout, which has led to a uh, sever between the diaspora and the native population? What sort of things contribute to misinformation building up in the conflict narrative? Look, I mean, absolutely, right? I, I mentioned the, you know, the, 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 the fact that aid agencies are not, uh, you know, have had to um, reduce their presence um, in Tigray and Northern Ethiopia more generally. That's one factor that's oftentimes a really good source of what I think is, is pretty impartial, a pretty impartial flow of information. But yeah, from the beginning of this crisis, the media blackout um, was a central problem, right? Um, and it, it, you know, when, when information is not readily available from the ground, then, you know, then misinformation, conspiracy, uh, these kinds of things um, can be can be peddled as truth, and it's really difficult to parse what is what is going on. So, um, I think that's a big part of it. Look, social media, you know, not not to make it all about social media, but social. I mean, uh, the 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 information space globally, but particularly in the Horn, has been democratized in some interesting ways. But it also has some pretty it can have some negative implications, right? Uh, so anything can spread virally now, um, and um, and so those, those platforms, I think, are perpetuating some of this as well. Of course, that's not a Horn of Africa or Ethiopia specific issue. That's a, that's a global problem. Well, the potential sanctions which the United States and the European Union are considering placing on all actors to their conflict will certainly be perceived negatively by the Ethiopian and Eritrean governments. But in the context of our conversation, we should know where the source of this consternation of sanctions comes from. Eritrea, as you may know, was sanctioned by the UN Security Council after the government's alleged support of armed resistance groups in Somalia, most notably Al-Shabaab, for, and for a border dispute that they had with Djibouti in 2008 that left several soldiers as prisoners of war. In the case of the current conflict in Tigray, there are some individuals who have been placed under sanctions, including Filippo Swolde Johannes, who has been targeted with the Global Magnitsky Act. Could you provide an explanation over what sanctions really do for Eritrea in particular, or just in general, and their intended purpose? Uh, is there a specific objective that uh, follows once sanctions are implemented? Um, well, I mean, I think, you know, this is, uh, again, not, not, a, not a sanctions expert, but, um, but I think ultimately it depends on what sort of sanctions instrument uh, we're talking about, right? Um, so if we go back to the, to the old UN Security Council sanctions regime uh, on Eritrea circa 2008, uh, 2009, I think, and then there was another UN Security Council resolution 2011. I mean, that was, initially it was an arms embargo primarily, um, and then, and then there was some scrutiny um, that was also through the sanctions regime placed on some financial networks um, related to mining in Eritrea um, and um, and diaspora finance as well. Um, I, it, these flows were not prohibited, but uh, but the 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 resolution, the UN Security Council resolution, created some scope for countries to scrutinize those flows, right? Um, so, you know, but that's not what we're talking about here, right? Uh, what, what's on the table right now are, are bilateral sanctions imposed by the United States um, on a range of actors, um, actors within the Eritrean government, elements of the TPLF, elements of, uh, you know, the federal government of Ethiopia, um, elements of the Amhara regional government. I mean, a whole range of actors. I think everyone um, is likely to be hit by, you know, by these sanctions measures. Um, you know, and so you talked about global Magnitsky. Um, I mean, global Magnitsky is, uh, you know, these are sanctions that target actors that are perpetrating, and I forget what the exact language is, but it's, you know, gross human rights abuses, corruption, sort of things of that nature. And these are, these are in most cases, personal financial sanctions um, on, on individuals uh, and their assets that may move through 
Western banking systems and institutions. Um, and then there are also some legal liability that these sanctions create for those actors and networks that do business with the sanctioned individuals, right? Um, what, what the Biden administration has also done is, um, is an executive order. Uh, they produce this executive order you might have heard of uh, uh, that gives them the ability uh, to really expand uh, the kinds of san sanctions that they may be able to place um, on actors involved in, in the Ethiopia crisis and perpetuating it. Um, so with Global Magnitsky, my understanding is the evidentiary bar is quite high in being able to pose it to impose it on particular individuals. Uh, there's just a lot of sort of bureaucratic um, churn that has to be that one has to go through to actually get to you know to placing global Glomag sanctions on an individual. Uh, but with this new sanctions regime Biden has put forward, it's going to be bureaucratically much easier for them to place it on individuals and also potentially entities, maybe commercial entities. It remains to be seen um, how how broad. Uh, the, the United States, the US government will be, the Biden administration will be in terms of applying sanctions. Um, do they go for a couple of individuals and entities? Uh, do they go for a broader set of individuals and entities? Um, it, it just, there's a lot of, we don't know yet. Um, uh, and we don't know, you know, when, when this decision on sanctions would come, it's, it, it remains to be seen. I've, I've heard uh, that it could be soon, um, but, you know, but that's been, that's, I think people have been saying it's going to be soon for a while. So it's, it's, it's sort of unclear. Well, the topics of our conversation all uh, center around the unsuredness or the potential for things to occur. But some things that I reference, I think, are based in his history, which unfortunately for the Eritrean people has uh, caused uh, a lot of grief. Uh, could you share how sanctions are negatively perceived by the diaspora population? Do they really affect the population in the way that uh, supporters or opposition members of, of the regime uh, explain? Is it due to the direct effects that they have on the population or does the government take out its anger on the civilian population? Well, okay, so I mean, I think it's useful to sort of think about um, sanctions regimes, um, bilateral, multilateral, um, in, in broader perspective. And it's almost always the case uh, when a sanctions regime is applied on a particular country that political leaders in that country um, use that moment and use the sanctions uh, to um, about how their country has been victimized or targeted by foreign actors, the international community. Um, and so it becomes a really important part of the, sort of their politics of resistance, right? Um, and, uh, and so you, you see that worldwide, you know, Cuba, Russia, I mean, you sort of Iran, you name it. Um, and certainly we can see that happen. That, that I think that's happened with Eritrea. I think, you know, that narrative is, is also been developed um, is, or is developing in, in Ethiopia. Um, so, so that's, that's there, obviously, um, you know, that this, that the, the whole idea of sanctions or the, the imposition of sanctions, um, you know, becomes itself weaponized by uh, political leaders um, to sort of uh, stir up um, anger, animosity, and to sort of push back on what is understood to be or perceived as negative foreign interference, right? So what we're seeing right now with respect to Eritrea and Ethiopia is not surprising. You see it in other, other places, right? Um, you know, in terms of the impact of sanctions, it, it really, George, depends on the design of the sanctions, right? Um, uh, you know, that said, even if we talk about smart sanctions or sanctions that are limited in scope, um, targets particular individuals or networks, I mean, they are likely to have some spillover more generally uh, on a country. It's kind of unavoidable. Um, so, you know, the thing with sanctions is that it comes with huge, oftentimes huge reputational risk. Even if the mandate of the sanctions are narrow, it's narrowly applied, you know, investors, uh, you know, other, other actors that are looking at the country will try and de-risk. Um, and so that can have impl broader implications. Um, so, so I, I, yeah, I mean, I think, I think uh, that is there. Um, and of course, um, you know, um, 
if we look, for instance, at the executive order that the Biden administration has pursued, they've tried to reduce some of the spillover by making very clear exceptions for humanitarian aid and other kinds of development activities, right? So there are ways to kind of get at this issue. But yes, even narrowly applied sanctions can sometimes have bigger impacts. But of course, you know, the cost of the sanctions, you know, have to be weighed against against the cost of an action, right? So it's a difficult, it's a difficult debate. It's a difficult question. Well, you spoke about how, uh, in general, the uh, rhetoric used by the receiving party is based off of uh, resistance. Does the Eritrean dictatorship use sanctions and anti-imperialist, anti-Western rhetoric to strengthen its base and promote nationalism or even exceptionalism? Is that evident in the way that criticism of the government by Eritreans has reduced over time due to the fear of being labeled as a traitor by the regime? Yeah, well, the second part of that question is, is an, an empirical question. I'm not, I'm not sure if, if resistance has necessarily reduced, but, but you know, it's, it, that'd be an interesting issue to talk about. Um, but yeah, of course, I mean, I think the Eritrean government, like many other governments around the world um, that had faced uh, international sanctions regimes has, has cultivated, has used it to cultivate and boost a national narr nationalist narrative. I, I think, so the shorter, short answer to your question is yes, it has done that as have a number of other countries. Um, I mean, I think there's a, there's a certain playbook uh, to the way that many countries respond to the imposition of sanctions. Um, so there's nothing particularly surprising about it in the Eritrean case. Meanwhile, Ethiopia, while recently being the target of increasing international pressure has not necessarily been under as much scrutiny as Eritrea over the years. What are some of the impacts that sanctions could have on Ethiopia if it were to occur? Since Ethiopia is one of Africa's most important countries in terms of economic and diplomatic activity. Well, the, the, the broader, the economic implications are, are different difficult uh, to assess because again, we don't know what the scope uh, of, of the sanctions will be. I mean, how far the Biden administration would go, you know, under the existing executive order. So again, that, that remains to be seen. There's been a lot of discussion about OGOA and the reduction or elimination of OGOA benefits uh, for Ethiopia, that, that could have some implications. Um, so yeah, I mean, I think, I think the potential implications are, are significant, uh, but how significant I think remains to be seen. Of course, even if the, the sanctions are narrowly applied, I mean, that there probably will be some broader reputational uh, damage uh, to the Ethiopian economy when you think about investors. I think that's, that's somewhat, uh, that, that likely can't be avoided. Um, and then I think the other implication, of course, uh, will be um, uh, an acceleration, uh, maybe not an acceleration, but a continuation of a trend we've been seeing uh, in terms of diplomatic relations between, you know, the West and Ethiopia. Um, obviously, Ethiopia is historically seen by the United States as your European partner as kind of a think. Um, you know, I think that is obviously, I think the war in Tigray, you know, the broader kind of political unraveling in Ethiopia, um, and then combined, you know, with, with you know, potential sanctions is, is likely going to um, you know, undercut uh, Ethiopia's status uh, as a regional anchor and sort of close relations uh, with the West. I think that's probably what's what's on the cards. Um, and and not, I'm not not here taking a position either way on, on the sanctions. Um, you know, I think you know uh, the cost of sanctions has to be weighed against you know the cost of an action. I'm just pointing out th these are likely the implications. Well, based on what has already happened in the war in Tigray, how has the United States-Ethiopia relations evolved over the course of the conflict? What inflection points are worth mentioning in their relationship since the armed conflict began? Yeah, well, I think, um, I mean, there are, there are a couple of things. Uh, I think towards the tail end of the Trump administration, uh, things had had gotten a little awkward between the United States, particularly the White House uh, and, and the Ethiopian government. So you probably remember this whole saga over the GERD. Um, and you know, I, I would say the, the pretty uh, you know, partisan manner uh, in which the Trump administration had engaged on GERD issues. Um, uh, 
uh, you know, very supportive of, of the Egyptian uh, position. I mean, that's a fraught issue that we don't need to get into. So that had, had created its intentions. Um, you know, when you get to the Tigray war, it's, it's an interesting discussion one could have. I think the Trump administration initially uh, sort of embraced, you know, the, the law enforcement uh, operation. Um, and then um, as the situation kind of deteriorated, began to walk away uh, from that support. So, um, so that I think was an inflection point. We're talking sort of mid to late November of 2020. Um, but you know, then you know, we get to yet another important inflection point, which were the U.S. elections and the Biden administration. So the Biden administration uh, made Ethiopia a priority, and they they tried to take, I think, uh, well, they they tried to engage robustly on a diplomatic level. And now we're obviously looking at other options. So I think that that was an important, uh, again, that was an important inflection point. But I think I think overall the the gravity of the situation in Tigray, Northern Ethiopia, more generally, uh, you know, the human rights crisis, the humanitarian crisis, the expansion of the conflict, has really alarmed um, many in the West, many in the region, right, many in the Horn of Africa region, um, and has over time encouraged them to take a, a stronger, more ro robust approach to really try and get the parties uh, to move towards peace, which is, which is very difficult. Well, a concern that the US has in terms of strategic significance is the increased role of Ethiopian troops from all over the country to be mobilized to fight in Tigray. The UN peacekeeping troops stationed in Somalia to fight the terrorist insurgency in Mogadishu have vacated and is leaving Somalia at risk of being entrenched in further civil conflict. Similarly, Ethiopian troops of Tigrayan origin have sought political asylum in South Sudan uh, over the perceived fear of being detained in Addis Ababa. With the culmination of all these troops uh, trying to fight in Tigray, in addition to all the civilians who are being recruited by the government, are these events a sign of the collapse of the Ethiopian society due to the increased emphasis of military involvement. Yeah, um, uh, I'm not sure I caught, you broke up a bit, so I'm not sure I caught the tail end of the question, but, but I think what I would say is, um, you know, one doesn't want to sound uh, alarmist, um, but I, I do think um, that um, state collapse, the frag Ethiopia's fragmentation is, is a very real, um, possibility at the moment. I don't want to say it's likely, but it's a very real possibility that, that external parties are concerned about, that many Ethiopians are concerned about, that others in the region are concerned about. Um, and it's one of the reasons that you're getting so much uh, attention and, and heat on the Ethiopia issue uh, at the moment. Um, and, uh, you know, there are a lot, of, a lot of layers to this, right? I mean, the way in which um, I mean, what we've seen, the, the secular trend with the conflict has been its militiaization, right? Where it's no longer just uniformed ENDF troops that are involved in combat, but the Ethiopian government has been forced to rely on mobilization of ethnic militia, particularly from the Amhara region, but from other regions of Ethiopia as well. Um, and so the conflict is now, it, it, it's not simply one between established political actors, but there is increasingly a people to people element to it. Um, in fact, you could say that it was there from the beginning, right? Because militias were involved from the beginning. I mean, that's, you know, that is, that is quite, uh, quite concerning. It, 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 it makes one worry about sort of the long-term health and viability of, of Ethiopia um, as a coherent political entity. Um, and that's, that's why it's, it's important. I mean, it's not, it's not over till it's over. I mean, I think there can be a course correction, um, but that's, that's one reason I think that, that external actors need to be engaged in, in getting to a diplomatic solution. I mean, the time is now that this conflict persists for any longer. Who knows where the situation is going to go? On the question of Western intervention in political and military affairs in Africa to prevent further violence, which, by the way, are seen as unnecessary and damaging to many people, what impact would U.S. interference have on Ethiopia in this crisis? And would there be any positive or negative outcomes that would result from such a move? Well, I think one, in, just as a general principle, I think one always needs to be wary um, of external intervention in any, in any crisis uh, scenario, right? Um, you know, but... So I think that has to be understood. I, I, look, the Horn of Africa, as you well know, George, is a region 
where external interventions of various types, diplomatic, military, don't have a great track record, right? Um, that said, um, I think if you are a responsible uh, uh, external stakeholder, uh, you, you have no choice but to engage uh, on the problems that are facing the Horn of Africa in general and the ones in Ethiopia in particular, right? This war is metastasizing. Uh, it's cannibalizing Ethio uh, the Horn of Africa's largest country. It is spreading and could likely spread beyond uh, Ethiopia's borders, right? And so everyone has a stake in getting the situation under control. I think the strategy from the United States um, and those, those external parties that are further afield uh, is to use whatever leverage and influence they have to catalyze a regional response, right? Because I think African voices and African leadership on this issue is really quite important. Um, EGAD, the African Union, key countries in the region really need to play a role in getting, getting a diplomatic process uh, going into the finish line. And so, but again, I mean, the role of, of the United States or the Europeans is, is should be to support, uh, to provide some, some leadership where necessary, to, to, to be a catalytic force, uh, but to let the, you know, to, to help support an agenda that is, is driven by, by countries and actors in the region. I think that that's, that's the way to go. And look, um, a lot of ink has been spilt about, you know, the failure of the African Union or EGAD to properly step up and address the crisis in Ethiopia, but some, some other regional crises as well. A lot of hand wringing about what EGAD did with South Sudan, for instance, right? Um, there's a long backstory to that. Um, but but I, I, I do think that, that if peace is going to be sustainable in this region, it needs, it needs buy-in from local actors. And, and uh, you know, I'll, I'll say a little bit more, um, you know, there are, there are important extra regional players beyond the United States, particularly in the Gulf, Turkey, I mean, these countries have to be, you know, I think it's a challenge, right? Uh, the UAE um, the UAE and Egypt are, are partners of the United States and one would like them, particularly the UAE, to be on side on these issues, right? But it's, it's not, not an easy game. So I think some, some tough conversations have to be held to, to, you know, with the UAE, by the United States, by countries in the Horn of Africa region uh, to convince them to be a supportive uh, as possible uh, uh, of a peace process uh, in Ethiopia and on other regional issues as well. Well, mentioning African diplomacy in terms of conflict resolution, Kenya held the presidency of the UN Security Council for the month of October 2021. Although there wasn't a significant amount of action that was produced, probably due to the veto powers of China and Russia, the Kenyan statement initially uh, marked the fact that Ethiopia needed to stop politicizing the humanitarian aspect of the crisis. Do you think that more African scrutiny is required in order to allow Ethiopia to recognize its shortcomings in the conflict in Tigray? Well, the, the Kenyans have had a kind of slow evolution uh, on the crisis in Ethiopia. Um, from initially, I think, you know, taking a bit of a hands-off approach. Of course, as you know, Kenya is an important player here because of their, their role in, in the Security Council, um, not to mention being an important EGAD country, the neighbor uh, of Ethiopia. Um, but I think as the situation in Ethiopia deteriorated, they, bec they became more alarmed um, and have taken a more, um, a more public position on what's going on, really insisting on what we all know which is this needs to end in a diplomatic and a political solution, right? That, that, that to some extent meets the interests of all of the various parties. Um, and so, um, you know, and so I think, I think the Kenyans need, need, you know, have to play an important role on, on, on this particular issue on the Ethiopian crisis, but, but there are others that are relevant as well. Of course, you know, the, the DRC, uh, and President Shisekedi hold, hold the, the AU uh, chairmanship. Uh, so they have a really important role to play as well. Um, it's really going to take, I think, many, many, many players across the African continent to, uh, to engage in this. But the Kenyans, I think, the Kenyans have some of the biggest interests at stake, right? And, and so they, you know, I think they have got to absolutely be engaged and, and show some leadership uh, on this. Kenya's going, by the way, though, Kenya's, you know, going towards elections pretty soon. Um, and so, you know, they're, they're likely to have their own domestic distractions and, 
know, never, never a dull day in the Horn of Africa, unfortunately. Maybe this is more of a speculative question and you don't have to answer, but are international interlocutors aware of the influence that the Eritrean dictatorship has had on the Ethiopian government's policy in Tigray? It's an interesting question. I mean, I would say, um, you know, I think the 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 relationship uh, between uh, Asmara and Addis was one that was uh, generally not, um, I wouldn't say understood, but it was not really seen as a relevant factor in terms of political developments in Ethiopia before November 2020. But I think obviously Obviously, after November 2020, uh, most external observers, uh, most countries in the region outside of it, uh, I think, understand uh, the the Eritrean dimension to some of what's going on in Ethiopia. I think that's it's sort of hard to miss, right? The peace, and, 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 oh, yeah. And, and yeah, and and indeed, I mean, uh, um, when when Eritrean forces were deployed uh, in Ethiopia and Tigray in force one of the lead demands of much of the international community was for their withdrawal, right? So, I mean, that's just one, in, that's one illustration, I think, of, of how, you know, of, of, of how many external parties uh, kind of, you know, the extent to which they were aware of, of, of that link. Um, so, yeah. Well, I mentioned that question because I personally think that the source of their collaboration began in the peace deal uh, that was signed in 2018, uh, which was supposed to produce change in Eritrea and in Ethiopia. And it seemed to have faltered in its effort to actually bring positive reforms. Some people argue that the deal, but which by the way, its contents have never been revealed or published, was actually a military pact between the heads of state of both countries. Uh, in retrospect, is there any evidence to suggest that this was the case. What can you conclude about the state of Eritrean Ethiopian relations since Abiy Ahmed took the premiership? Gosh, I mean, it is. It is obviously this has been a source of tremendous amounts of speculation, a lot of writing on this subject. Um, it is. It is exceedingly hard to know uh, what was given the degree of secrecy around around the, around the relationship between um, leaders, both in Asmar and Addis. You know, and their interaction uh, with the leadership in Mikelet, it's, it's very difficult to know uh, and decipher what the true intentions of, of the parties were at particular points in time. I mean, I, I do think we can say uh, with the benefit of hindsight, right? although some said it at the time, that there was a security or military dimension uh, to, the, to the pact uh, or agreement between the leaderships in, in Eritrea and, and Ethiopia, federal government in Ethiopia. Um, Obviously, that was stated in the you know the, the the friendship agreement that there was going to be coordination on security affairs. But what I mean more specifically um, is that there was a a, a security alliance uh, that targeted um, the political leaders in Tigray, right? The TPLF. Yeah, I don't think there is really much dispute about that. Um, that you know, one could debate whether that was a sum total uh, of the agreement, whether that's all that there was. But I think that was quite clearly one dimension of it. I think, I think Prime Minister Abiy wanted to corral and contain the TPLF. I mean, we obviously know about, about the Eritrean president's long and difficult relationship with the TPLF. And so you know, it's possible he had a more expansive vision uh, in terms of dealing with the TPLF that perhaps he wanted them, them ousted, right? Um, that's possible. Again, hard to decipher. You know, but I, I wouldn't, I think there were a lot of, let me say this, I think there were a lot of twists and turns in the kind of saga between Addis Mekele and, and Asmara over the last three years. And I wouldn't necessarily draw a straight line between that agreement um, and the war we are now seeing, right? Clearly it fed into it, um, but there were off ramps. Um, there were opportunities uh, to stabilize the situation. Um, and for a lot of reasons that they weren't seized. Um, uh, so, so I think that's that's where that's sort of where I would uh, I I would leave it. Um, you know, and, and my view is uh, it's a terrible conflict. Uh, a lot of harm has been done. I think I think political leaders on all sides really deserve a significant amount of blame. Right? I mean, it, it there's blame enough, frankly, to go around uh, when we look at the origins of this crisis. 
Um, and that's not meant to, to suggest an equivalence in the suffering of different people. I mean, we could debate all of those things, but this, this was really a shared failure in my, in my view. Well, some of the off uh, chances that you uh, noted as having been opportunities for peace to actually uh, come to fruition, some uh, of those events include the shutdown of the border after its opening, uh, once the peace deal was signed. Uh, others speculate that the increased visits that Abi was taking to uh, Eritrea was also an uh, important uh, revelation in the increased involvement between Eritrea and Ethiopia. Some of these uh, I may be uh, citing from uh, sources who uh, knew of their travels uh, up until the war in Tigray, including Isaias's visit to Bishoftu uh, at the Air Ethiopian uh, Air Force Base. Is there a possibility that Isaias saw in Abi a potential interlocutor that he could sabotage in order to benefit his regime? Was there a way that he could foresee the collaboration of his army with Ethiopia to overpower the Tigray regional state? Yeah, again, um, you know, George, th these are these are fraught and contentious questions. Um, you know, I think I think some some would argue um, that this this whole, you know, what we're what we're seeing right now was by design. And this was the the intention of of of, um, of the Eritrean president for the beginning. Um, it's really, really hard, hard to say. I mean, what I what I would add um, and I'm not discounting uh, the, the possibility of, of those kinds of motivations. You know, there was a moment, for instance, when uh, there seemed to be a dialogue between Debrecen and Isaias, you know, that, 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 uh, that, the, that awkward picture of them holding hands at one point. Um, and, I, and, and from what I do understand, there was at some moment um, um, some potential uh, of, of dialogue, of a meeting of the minds uh, between Michaela and Asmara. How real that was, I don't, it's hard to say. Um, but I think, you know, I think, uh, again, just to go back to the point I made before, there's no doubt that the security dimensions of the PAC in 2018 created volatility and instability, mutual security dilemmas that led to this crisis, right? You can make that connection. But I also think that over time, there were opportunities to peace for peace to consolidate and, and to consolidate peace between all the parties. Um, and, and that didn't happen. Uh, and of course, you know, one implication of the security pact uh, back in 2018 was that, you know, the Tigray, the Tigray side was, was basically cut out of the deal, right? I mean, they were not really a key stakeholder in, in, in the fostering of the Ethiopia Eritrea peace. And I think if you want durable peace, then obviously they've got to be part of the conversation, right? Uh, and so that is, that is part of how we got uh, to this point, including, I think, some miscalculations by their own leadership as well, right? Again, it's, it's a shared, it's a shared, shared burden. I think it all feeds into the opaqueness of the situation leading up to what we're seeing now is the actual demonstration of all of these failures that you're mentioning. A part of the process of conflict resolution, of course, is to analyze the risk benefit of a dispute in which the interest of outside powers is at risk as well. I referenced security in the context of Ethiopia earlier in our discussion, as I mentioned, it's been a partner of US's uh, counterterrorism effort uh, for years. But now with the increased instability in all of these countries throughout the Horn of Africa, is the US weighing its concern between the current instability in Tigray and the possible volatility throughout the entire region if it doesn't decide to act or do anything of significance? Yeah, I think there are, you know, from the U.S. perspective, and I imagine this is a case for the Europeans as well, even countries in the region, I mean, there are competing priorities here, right? I mean, Ethiopia is, again, has historically been a regional rank anchor, really quite important uh, when we think about uh, the stabilization of Somalia, um, South Sudan. Um, I mean, if we get to the Sudans, I mean, Ethiopia has peacekeepers deployed to multiple missions, right? Um, you know, it's the seat of the AU. It, it's, it's been a really important conduit through which the United States has tried to pursue some of its interests, uh, particularly in regional peace and security. And so they are, they're obviously loath. I mean, any administration is going to be loath uh, to do anything that would severely undermine their relationship with the incumbent in Addis, right? That's not a new thing. That's a historical, <laughs> historical thing. We could go back 
you know, you know the, the story about how Eritrea was incorporated into Ethiopia, right? And, and sort of <laughs> the way in which the US um, enabled it, right? Uh, uh, because of some broader geopolitical interests, okay? And, uh, and so the, the story now is in some sense no different. Um, at the same time though, I think the crisis has gotten to the point where external actors really wonder about the basic territorial integrity and stability of Ethiopia, right? Um, and so, you know, so some have told me, you know, Ethiopia used to be a net exporter of stability, right? Um, you know, and now it's, it's a net exporter of instability. And so that's kind of changing, I think, the calculus in many, in many Western capitals. Um, and then, of course, there, there are normative dimensions to this. Nobody wants to see, you know, war crimes, famine, um, you know, the, the, the potential death of a democratic transition project. I mean, that's not, these normative issues do play uh, in many capitals around the world. And so, you know, that, I think that is, that is an issue as well. Remember, I mean, Ethiopia and Sudan were, were seen as kind of, um, you know, that they were going to be avatars of regional political transition, right? That they were going to be the, the forefront of this regional transformation. Um, and, and that was an idea that captured the imagination of a lot of people, you know, and, and, and obviously things have not turned out in that way. Um, and so at a normative level, there's a certain disappointment uh, with what's happened. Well, turning back into some of the mechanisms of the conflict, uh, Sudan's role in the war in Tigray is really based off of the indirect contact that it has with the Ethiopian government. Mainly, I'm citing back to those examples of the Al Fashaga border dispute and the GERD. But with the refugee flows of Tigrayans into eastern Sudan and their own domestic political crisis that's threatening the leadership of the country, what reasonable possibilities are there for international organizations to provide assistance in the midst of a conflict zone that is growing? Since the only outside link that the Tigray region has is with Sudan. How does uh, that uh, play in the coming months, if that's even a question that we could really think about? Yeah, I mean, that's a, look, I mean, I think, um, let's, let's, you know, be honest. I mean, uh, you know, Tigray really doesn't have uh, much of a humanitarian outlet, right? I mean, from the earliest stages of the war, um, you know, the, the frontier zones border with Sudan was effectively cut, right? Um, um, and uh, as it stands, um, you know, the, the federal government of Ethiopia and its allies um, are, are occupying, um, you know, Western Tigray, um, you know, or what, what the Tigrayan side calls Western Tigray. And so that's a dispute, you obviously know about the dispute, uh, territorial dispute. Um, so they've been, they, I think they've actually been shut off from access to Sudan. And in fact, I think you would have seen much larger refugee flows I mean, I think at the end of the day, the, the camps in Eastern Sudan um, that are housing, or the, the number of Tigrayan refugees that we've seen in, in Eastern Sudan, something like 50 to 60,000, it would have been far larger had there not been, had the border not been closed, right? Um, it was you know, dangerous for Tigrayans to try and cross, right? People were shot and all the rest of it. Um, and so, um, so in that sense, uh, you know, political instability in Sudan is going to create a problem, I think, uh, you know, at a humanitarian level for the refugees that are in Eastern Sudan already. Um, and, you know, there have been issues with some of the camps, um, some local politics around them. And so, yeah, the instability could complicate that. There was flooding, major flooding in some of the camps some time ago, and there was a whole debate about whether the camp should be moved and what local communities thought about it, what political actors in Khartoum thought about where they, they would move the camp. So it was so that obviously is going to complicate, I think, addressing the needs of, of, of individuals in the camp. Um, you know, I, I think this is a bit speculative, but I think there is some, you know, even though the border is closed and militarized, I think there probably is some Tigrayan, sort of Tigrayan political actors are, are moving across the border to a limited extent, um, but not, not in the way that would allow there to be an actual humanitarian corridor. corridor. Now, if, by some means, uh, you know, the TDF gets to the Sudanese border and it carves out a corridor through Western Tigray, then it's a, it's a different, it's a totally different situation. Um, 
And to the extent that they seem to be looking, again, this is speculative, to the extent that they seem to be pursuing a humanitarian corridor, it looks like it actually might be on the Eastern side where they're trying to basically get to the, to the Djibouti, the, the Ethiopia Djibouti road and basically open up a, a, an aid route. Although it's hard to say how well, you know, how that's going to work um, uh, at a political level because, uh, you know, Djibouti would have to play ball and it's a, it would be a complicated issue. Essentially the feasibility of the Ethiopia Djibouti road would be uh, based off of Djibouti's own interest of allowing aid to flow into Tigray, which would then, of course, the question would come up, is Djibouti aiding Tigray, which the Ethiopian government perceives as being hostile to its interest. Is that correct? Um, that they perceive who is being hostile to their interests. Uh, Djibouti is hostile to Ethiopia's interest by funding or aiding uh, Tigray. Well, I, I think the current relations between Ethiopia and Djibouti are, are cordial. There were some tensions, I think, that emerged uh, after the leadership transition in Ethiopia in 2018. But you know, those are two countries that, that need each other because of you know the trade route and outlet to the sea. The sea. And, uh, yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a really. I mean, Ethiopia needs outlet to the sea, and, and Djibouti, you know, it, its economy really is designed is based on the fact that it's an outlet for Ethiopian goods and services. So, um, so they need each other, but I think if, if the TDF was able to, you know, get to the Djibouti-Ethiopia road, Djibouti might face a, a difficult diplomatic question, right? Um, you know, and, and maybe the international community could make a difference. I mean, would they open up, you know, would they allow aid to move through Djibouti port, you know, through the road, um, you know, into, then it would go, you know, in an eastward, uh, western westerly direction into Tigray. Um, you know, how would that work? It's, I, I don't know. Um, I haven't thought about it in great depth, but I imagine it would be a difficult, uh, a difficult issue. And of course, um, you know, the Ethiopian government would still have air power, um, potentially drones. And so like, how safe would that humanitarian corridor be? I mean, it's a lot of questions I don't have answers to. Well, maybe just a brief question before I cover my next topic, but is it significant that Ethiopia is landlocked, especially in this context where they are not able to have a direct outlet to the sea? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, Ethiopia is the most populous landlocked country in the world, right? Um, and so by, by a long shot. And so, yeah, I mean, I think that has historically been a, an economic challenge uh, for them, right? I mean, it, it limits, I think, the prospects uh, of growth uh, in some interesting ways. Um, you know, it also, also has become a bit of a political question uh, in Ethiopia as well. Uh, you know, the fact that, you know, that Ethiopia sh should strive for an outlet to the sea and there's owed an outlet to a sea and there's an interesting politics and discussion around that, uh, particularly in Ethiopian nationalist circles. Um, so yeah, I think it is, the, the, the access to the sea issue has historically been and we can go back to the imperial era has been an important element of Ethiopian foreign policy, how it engages in the world. I mean, the whole saga around Eritrea was obviously informed in many ways by that reality, that drive to get to the sea and have access to the sea. Um, you know, so that's, that's a difficult kind of geopolitical question. It's going to loom large, I think, in, in Ethiopia's relations with its neighbors, relations with Eritrea going forward. I mean, those are <laughs> difficult, weighty questions. Well, Prime Minister Abiy stated that the war effort in Tigray would last a couple of weeks at most and did not call the armed conflict that we're seeing now a war, but rather a quote, law enforcement operation. And in addition to mobilizing the troops from the Amhara region, Eritrean troops were involved in the fighting far beyond the border uh, areas of Badme, Humara, and Zalambesa. Of course, after months of denials, Prime Minister Abiy had to admit the presence of Eritrean troops and justified their involvement as being crucial for their own national security. Firstly, what is your reflection on Eritrea's involvement in the conflict? This may be a personal question, but I still want to ask because it does go into a great deal of uh, consternation among Eritreans who either support or are indifferent to the current uh, action? Yeah, I mean, I think my take on that would be, um, 
you know, uh, you know, Eritrea's intervention, uh, the Eritrean leadership's intervention in, in, in the conflict in northern Ethiopia was not, was not helpful and I think, you know, fueled the crisis, frankly. I mean, it's not, obviously, ownership for the crisis uh, lays primarily with the two main participants, you know, the, on the Tigrayan side and, of course, uh, on the federal government side and other Ethiopian actors in the, in the Amhara region. But of course, you know, the, the, the role of Eritrea was quite significant and important in, in catalyzing the conflict. Um, it, it made the human, human rights and humanitarian crisis really complex and fraught. Um, and you, you've heard all of the reports, obviously. And so that, you know, I think that there was, there was that issue. Um, and, um, uh, and of course, this is an issue that, that obviously has implications for air trains, right? I mean, so the intervention wasn't good, I think, for Ethiopia and the, you know, the nature of that crisis, how it evolved, even getting to a political resolution right now. But for Eritreans, I mean, look at what happened, you know, the refugees and Eritrean refugees in Ethiopia were put under uh, tremendous duress, right? Um, you know, the sort of the way the war involved, they apparently were targeted by, by all sides of the conflict, right? So there's that. Um, there's, of course, the fact that Eritreans, young Eritreans are being deployed to fight in the war, which is not not good. I imagine many of them against their, their own will. Um, you know, and then further afield, you know, you have to think about how this whole crisis plays out politically and whether there is blowback uh, on, on air trains and the air train people because of the way this war is transpired. Like where, where does it end? What is the end game? Is there a possibility that the conflict spills over to Eritrea? I mean, that's a possible scenario, right? Given where this conflict is going. So um, it's already spilled over into outside of Tigray, right? Uh, into neighboring Ethiopian regions. So these, you know, these are, these are worrying questions. And look, um, you know, um, my, my default position on these kinds of things tends to be, yeah, I mean, uh, participating in an armed conflict is, is not a good thing, right? Uh, almost under any scenario, right? And, and you have to do everything you can to, to avoid, avoid uh, being enmeshed in that kind of situation. Um, so it's really, it's, it's unfortunate. Well, why doesn't the political arena for these sort of issues exist? Uh, Ethiopia, relatively speaking, is a democratic state in certain regards. You contrast that with Eritrea, which is a complete totalitarian dictatorship. Why hasn't there been a resolution in terms of legal or political uh, settlements rather than taking this into war? Is this a reflection of the failure of leadership from the different sides to the conflict? Yeah, I mean, I think it's uh, clearly what we're seeing, witnessing right now is, um, is, a, is a failure of leadership. It's a shared failure across the board. And we could have a, a debate, and there is a debate about how you apportion blame. <laughs> um, you know, I, I'm not suggesting it's necessarily equal, but, um, but there is shared blame. And look, I think you have to, and I, I led with this earlier on, um, it's a, it's a leadership failure, but it's also about the nature of leadership in this particular region. Um, highly autocratic, militarized, oftentimes focused on, on narrow uh, political gains and, and pursuing foreign policy that really is about the protection of, uh, and monopoly of political power within their, their own countries, right, by guaranteeing it. And that's going to lead to a very fraught system of international relations. So if we want, I think, to fundamentally get to peace in the Horn of Africa, we do have to talk about uh, the democratizing of political space, of accountable rule of law based governments that pursue foreign policies based on the interests of their own people, right? And that applies, of course, to Eritrea, absolutely. But it also applies in, in other neighboring countries, right? It applies in Ethiopia, applies, you know, democratization of political space in Tigray, Sudan, Djibouti, it's, it's, a, it's, it's all over the place. And, um, and I think until we begin to see those kinds of institutional transformations in Eritrea and elsewhere, you know, we're going to see this pattern of conflict and crisis, uh, conflict between countries, just keep on going on and on and on. This may be a difficult question uh, to answer. Uh, many Eritreans have argued that following the border war uh, between 1998 and 2000, uh, that the TPLF is an existential threat to Eritrea. The indefinite nature of the military service, complete restriction on personal freedoms, and intolerance to political and governmental differences since that time has objectively strangled and stagnated Eritrea in the name of fending off a foreign enemy. 
Now with the current war being fought for a year with no foreseeable end in sight, can it be argued that the Eritrean regime, the PFDJ, is an existential threat to Tigray? Yeah, again, George, a loaded and very fraught question. I mean, I think um, uh, obviously uh, if you talk to Tigrayans, I mean, they would be of, of that view, right? Um, you know, given the difficult history of, of, of relations between, you know, PFDJ, the leadership, TPLF, um, and obviously Eritrea's intervention um, in, in Tigray and everything that's transpired in the course of that intervention. Um, you know, of course, there's a counter narrative as well, right? You know, there are some uh, those associated with the PFDJ who you know would say the same thing about the TPLF. Um, but I, I do think um, I don't I don't have a great answer other than to say I think we need a change in the character and nature of leadership, absolutely in in Asmara, but you know around the region as well, right? Um, you know the same kind of hubris and militarism that we see with respect to the PFDJ also been echoed by the TPLF. It's echoed by the Prosperity Party at the moment. And you see it around the region as well. We need, we need a mentality shift and we need a change in the structure of power, right? Um, so that's, that's sort of what I would say. I think that's kind of a non-answer, but you know, that, is, that is a narrative, but their are counter narrative is difficult to reconcile. Them. It's not an easy question. I yeah. ask it because I think it, concludes what many people have been trying to delay, which is acknowledging the very uh, com complex reality of the regional authorities. Having said that, where is it really appropriate to attribute blame? Is it solely to the military leadership, the political leadership, or is it a combination of both? Or is it the natural circumstances of the region which yield conflicts to deteriorate into all out violence? Should we even be thinking in terms of the points that I just mentioned when analyzing war, or is there a different perspective to utilize that you would like to mention? I mean, I think, look, I think um, first and foremost, one has to, has to look at, at, at leadership, right? At all levels. Um, but I think society and social forces play a role as well. Um, I'm just was reflecting on this particular conflict you know, there were a lot of a lot of actors that that frankly cheered for this conflict, right? Um, or perhaps that's too long a stronger word. Um, endorsed it, um, thought it was a prudent course of action, thought it was inevitable. And I just, you know, you know, so you know that makes me feel as if when we talk about accountability, uh, and I don't mean in a legal sense, I just mean in a sort of uh, sort of in a normative sense. You know, accountability is broadly distributed, right? Leaders make decisions, uh, but but social forces make that possible. Um, and so, and so that's I, yeah, I think that's sort of how how I would see it. You know, if we we step outside the region, look at the role of of, of external actors. Yeah, a lot of external actors were asleep at the wheel, um, in the sense that they didn't do enough to head off this crisis uh, as it was escalating. I mean, in some cases, they kind of endorsed it. Um, at least in the beginning. And I think that was hugely problematic. Um, but, but yeah, I mean, I think that's sort of, you know, where we are. Well, in closing, I want to speak about the history of what uh, led to this war, the precedent, essentially, which is the border war over Badme. Of course, the situation is much more politicized than that. And there are so many other issues that went into what happened. And Badme is perceived by some as the flashpoint or the tipping point of when the actual armed conflict in 1998 began. The relevant political actors that were involved in the negotiations in 2000 have either died or disappeared. For instance, Sayam Mesfin, who was the Ethiopian foreign affairs minister, and Haile Wolde Tensai, who was the Eritrean uh, foreign minister, uh, are among many who knew information about their respective government's attitude towards non-hostility, demarcation of the border, among other things. But of course, many of these uh, people have uh, left the political scene. The EPRDF's refusal to implement the Boundary Commission's uh, results in 2002 is seen as a point where the political dispute between Eritrea and Ethiopia uh, diffused into the population which caused more visceral and personal uh, reactions against one another. 
Uh, my question is, did any legal uh, arbitration uh, infrastructure exist in Eritrea or in Ethiopia? And did they have the capacity to collectively negotiate some sort of settlement with international bodies? Or were these institutions weakened uh, perhaps by either party in order to sustain uh, a rivalry that would see the complete destruction of the opposite side? I know it's a very complex question, but I ask yeah. it because it's it's a really complex issue. Yeah, well, I mean, the, the border issue was was submitted to international arbitration, right? As, as you know, so it was taken out of the realm of uh, sort of um, it was taken out of the region and was was given. You know, there was a you know the EEBC, and you know the backstory, right? And um, you know, and unfortunately, when that decision came out, it was it was a source of controversy. The Ethiopian government was at that time. For various reasons, not willing to, to pursue it um, and to implement it, and so that I think, I think that was one of the things that uh, uh, that perpetuated the crisis and the conflict uh, between the two uh, the two countries and the two parties. Al although I tend to think, even with the border issue off the table, the conflict probably would have continued. Right? Uh, I tend to think that the rivalry between the PFDJ and the TPLF. Is about much more was about much more than than boundaries, right? I think there were a broader set of issues at stake, um, including the fundamental question of, of regional supremacy. Um, I think that that was that was really what, what was on the table. And so, um, so yeah, I mean that's not a direct answer to your question. It was never. Uh, I mean, one could could ask about the failures of um, domestic political and legal institutions in Eritrea and Ethiopia to resolve the crisis, the border crisis before it began. Um, and that's a that's also a sad saga, right? Is that um, there was obviously a dialogue between the two sides on the border issue on many issues, and they just failed. Um, they failed to to hash it out, um, you know. And then a couple of armed incidents, um, you know, given the militarism of the parties, led to this catastrophic war. Um, so. Um, but yeah, I mean, that's sort of what I would, would say, George. I don't know if it's really an answer to your question, but um, but yeah, I mean, it was, this was really, I mean, the, the border issue was really handed off to international arbitration. And, you know, at that point, it was sort of on the parties to, to you know, to implement the decision consistent with their, with their commitments. But there were a whole broader set of issues at stake uh, between between the parties. I think it's a, it's a holistic answer. Perhaps something which is, if it's proven to be true, would be absolutely uh, a very interesting revelation. But do you think Eritrea, the Eritrean government, I mean, um, was sort of uh, uh, approving of the border situation in the sense that they were able to legitimize their uh, dictatorial and autocratic uh, tendencies? I'm, I'm talking about uh, the mobilization of troops to the border and sustaining a high level of repression in order to keep the political situation intact. Do you think that the conflict was a blessing in disguise for the dictatorship? Yeah, I mean, what the government's actual intentions were with respect to resolving the border dispute is hard to say, but I don't think one can dispute that it, that it was uh, politically advantageous to them, right? That it was, that it was wielded uh, to uh, construct this narrative, this national security narrative, uh, that they used, I think, frankly, to monopolize political power, right? I mean, that's, you know, it's, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to see the ways in which uh, the leadership uh, in Eritrea benefited from, you know, from the continuation of that crisis. But, uh, you know, was it something that um, they they actively sought, you know, that were they, they interested in, in blocking implementation of the boundary decision? Like, I, I don't know if I would go that far. Um, you know, perhaps some historian will, will look at that issue. Um, that's a simple, that's a different question, but I, of course they benefited from it. And I would say, you know, just just uh, for fairness and balance, because um, you can tell I'm about that, right? I mean, there were it's absolutely the case that uh, I think in Ethiopia as well there were there were some political actors and conf configurations that benefited from the perpetuation of 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 the rivalry with Eritrea in the border crisis, particularly in the security apparatus. Dr. Wildemariam, I would like for you to have the last word. <laughs> 
Great, uh, George. I, I'll keep it brief. And, and just what I would say is, you know, thank you uh, for the chance uh, to engage with you. Uh, it's really a, a pleasure to see uh, young Airtrans doing this kind of work, uh, engaging in the public, public square, public sphere. I think it's really important. And I, I applaud you and your, you and your uh, collaborators. And I would just say, uh, keep up the good work. Dr. Waldemarium, thank you.